Good morning. And welcome to this occasion of celebrating the life of Suthia, who is dearly loved by her children, grandchildren, family, and friends. For us here at Ebenezer, she was our sister in the Lord. And so today we feel the keen sense of loss of her presence for the friendship and the love that she expressed all through her life. And this memorial service is a time where we give praise to God for Susie and for the positive impact that she had on our lives and what she leaves behind. And at the same time, we want to acknowledge the pain, the grief that we are feeling and of this separation. And our hope is that the music, the words from and of scripture, as well as the memories that are going to be shared, are going to strengthen you emotionally and spiritually for the time that lies ahead. I want to greet you with some words from 1 Peter chapter 3, which came to mind when I thought of Susie as they speak of the godly woman that she was. The Apostle Peter in this passage is encouraging us to strive to be known for the attributes that define what is true, lasting beauty. He says there, beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. When I think of Susie Epp, these words describe her well. She was of gentle and quiet spirit. She also had physical beauty, but that was not her focus. Her attention was on the Lord and how she might demonstrate him. And this is a beautiful legacy that she has left behind. And as we remember and give thanks for her, may God comfort us with our memories and what he has to say to us today through this time of worship together. Let's pray. Gracious Father, each of us has a beauty in our own way that is given by you. Susie was your child, and she had sought to enhance her beauty by being a person of inward and outward gentleness. And as we seek you and listen to you today, May we recognize where we might enhance our beauty in our own lives. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Now music was a very meaningful part of Susie's life. And this morning we're going to be singing some of her favorite hymns. And later we're going to hear from the ladies choir that she was a part of for many years. Marley Boschman is going to lead us in the first congregational hymn, and that's going to be followed by a reading from Werner Braun from Psalm 23. And then the program is going to be followed by what you see in the bulletin. And as each individual comes up, please introduce yourselves and your relationship to the family. Please take your English hymnal and go to page 544, Blessed Assurance. Susie was a part of this choir for many, many years, I think over 25, and uh, that's why you're here today, to remember her life. Blessed Assurance, we will sing all three verses, please.
Ich lese den 23. Psalm, ein Psalm Davids. Der Herr ist mein Hirte, mir wird nichts mangeln. Er weidet mich auf einer grünen Aue und führet mich zu frischem Wasser. Er erquicket meine Seele. Er führet mich auf rechter Straße um seines Namens willen. Und ob ich schon wanderte im finstern Tal, fürchte ich kein Unglück, denn du bist bei mir, dein Stecken und Stab trösten mich. Du bereitest vor mir einen Tisch im Angesicht meiner Feinde. Du salbest mein Haupt mit Öl. Du schenkest mir voll ein. Gutes und Barmherzigkeit werden mir folgen mein Leben lang. Und ich werde bleiben im Hause des Herrn. Immer da. Good morning. Uh, ich bin Ferdinand Heide. Uh, uh, that's what Tante Susi, or Max and Morris, Theo and me, got into a lot of trouble on that farm. And uh, the youngest son of Victor and Adeline Heide, and I like to share Tante Susi's story. Our mother, Tante Susi, 
was born on June 10, 1943, in Niederhortica, Ukraine, to Dietrich and Susanna Thiessen Schellenberg. From the Ukraine, Russia, at that time, they moved to Germany, where brothers George and Peter were born. With fear of the communists taking Russians back to their homeland, they fled to Paraguay on the ship Heinzelmann. In Paraguay, brother Henry was born, and shortly after, sister Annie arrived. Zuzi's mother passed away, leaving her father Dietrich to raise five children, ages three months to 10 years, on his own. When Zuzi was 15, her father passed away, leaving the children orphaned. This led them to be adopted out in the colony and Zuzi was taken in by the Unro family. During this time, she had the opportunity to work at the hospital. At the age of 16, she was baptized upon her faith in Jesus Christ. At 17, Zuzi met her future husband, Viliep, they were married on August 26, 1961. The following year, in June 1962, their first of four children, Karen, was born. Norbert was born in October 1966. At this time, they began to plan their move to Canada. In October 1967, they arrived in St. Catharines, Ontario. And just before Christmas of that same year, they bought their first house on 639 Niagara Street. Teo was born in May of 1972, and three months later, they packed up all their belongings and moved to Vancouver, British Columbia. In 1973, they moved once more to Abbotsford, where they attended Ebenezer Mennonite Church. In 1977, Zuzi and Willie purchased a hobby farm on 1486 Townline Road, where Suzy still resided. In December of 1979, Orlando was born. Susie kept busy raising her family as well as doing day work cleaning houses. Susie loved the farm life, gardening, milking Daisy the cow, tending to all the animals from chickens to kittens, and working in the garden until evening. Susie and Willie would often sit on the patio watching the sunsets. Susie never shied away from any work. She just got it done. Her and Willie enjoyed a few trips to Paraguay and Mexico. Then in the spring of 1987, Willie, her husband, for over 25 years, was diagnosed with leukemia. On December 13th, 1987, he was called home to be with the Lord. To help Susie deal with the loss of her husband, she focused on raising her children and getting more involved in the church, in the Frauenfrei, the Lady Circle, as a deacon and singing in the Mennonettes Choir. Susie was happiest singing or working in the kitchen. During this time, Susie's path crossed with a Funk family, which led to many decades of cherished memories. Susie enjoyed having her family gather for any and many occasions, and no one would ever leave hungry. For many summers, her brother George and his wife Nora would drive to Abbotsford from Winnipeg to take Susie and Orlando to the Okanagan, and then down to Leavenworth, Washington. Susie loved visiting Victor and Adeline Haida and Sam and Arm, as well as traveling with them to Mexico. She also went yearly to Camp Squia with her church and made a few trips to Paraguay and Hawaii. Susie enjoyed bowling with Mrs. Reinke and played table games with her on Thursday evenings. In September of 1998, Susie's only granddaughter, Sydney, was born. Sydney was and remained the apple of Susie's eye. Through the years, Sydney was brought everywhere, from bowling, to working in the church kitchen, to singing with the church choir. Sydney was the youngest Mennonette, I do believe. <laughs> Susie made sure that all her children and her granddaughter went to German school to preserve their German heritage. In the spring of 2006, Susie was diagnosed with muscular de degeneration. Yet like with anything else, she did not let it slow her down. Then in the spring of 2013, Susie had a knee replacement. With her new knee, and losing a lot of weight because of diabetes, she had a new lease on life and nothing was going to stop her. In the beginning of October of 2018, Susie was told that they found cancer cells in her blood test. While waiting to see a specialist, not knowing what kind of cancer she had, Susie began to have abdominal pain. On November 4th, Susie went to emergency to fast track the diagnosis of her disease. Seven hours later in the emergency, they told Susie 
that she had pancreatic cancer and that, uh, and that it had already spread. A week later, Susie and Theo met with a surgeon in New Westminster to see if it was operable. But they were given the information that it was an aggressive stage four cancer. Biopsy was then done. On November 27th, Susie went to the cancer clinic to discuss options, and she opted out of chemotherapy treatments, having seen what close family members had gone through. Early December, Susie's sister and niece from Paraguay came for two weeks to visit, followed by all of Susie's brothers and their wives from Winnipeg and Ontario. It was a wonderful reunion, which will never be forgotten. After her siblings returned home, Susie took a turn for the worst and was hospitalized for eight days. By the second day of hospitalization, she was feeling great again, with a change in her pain medication, and she began to eat and drink more. Prayers were answered when Susie could spend Christmas at home. She even mustered up enough strength to attend the Christmas Eve program and the Christmas Day program at Ebenezer Church one last time. Shortly before New Year's Eve, Susie was again rushed to emergency due to complications with blood clots in her lungs. At this time, medications were increased and blood thinners were introduced. She was moved to the Cheam Palliative Care Wing. Susie had many visitors, and she remained there until the Lord came calling, surrounded by her children and her granddaughter. Until we meet again, we love you, we miss you, we will never give up. Auf Wiedersehen.
My name is Corinne Funk, and I was a friend of Mrs. Epps. Perhaps I should just begin by saying that throughout my remarks, I refer to Susie Epp as Mrs. Epp. <laughs> and Ron and I, my husband, we were talking on our way to the service today as to why that was exactly. And we decided that it began as a measure of respect in regard to the difference in our ages. But then I thought, I have a sister and a brother as old as Mrs. Epp. So, Anyway, our children were born, and uh, they naturally called Mrs. Epp, Mrs. Epp, of course. And so that's just the way it was. And that's just the way it always would be. Thirty years ago, there was a knock at my front door, and I opened my door to find a newly widowed Mrs. Epp and her young son, Orlando, standing beside her. We had not met before that day, but Mrs. Epp was seeking employment, and she had been recommended to me by an acquaintance. She became our newborn's first babysitter, and as time went by, our housekeeper, but most importantly, Mrs. Epp became our friend. For three decades, Mrs. Epp was a part of our family. Twice a month on Friday, she would arrive at our home. Invariably, if the day was fair, she would comment on how much she loved the sunshine and the feel of the warm sun on her face. If the day was rainy or cold, or worse yet, snowy, well, let's just say, of that weather she was not so enamored. She would spend the morning cleaning and organizing, and at times I would bemoan to her the messy state of my kids' rooms and their clear preference for chaos over order. Mrs. Epp would listen to my complaints, and then she would reply in her soft voice, they will learn, they will learn. At noon, I would make lunch, and the two of us would sit down at the table and eat together. We would talk about all sorts of things. Our children, separated by a generation. Her granddaughter, Sydney. My rose garden. Her rose garden. The little birds enjoying their lunch outside at my bird feeder. We would speak of new birth, the inevitable deaths of loved ones, and all of life caught up between the two. There was never a doubt about that which was closest to Mrs. Epps' heart, her family, her faith, her church, beautiful music, her flowers, her bowling team, and her endless batches of barn cats, whom, I might add, benefited from any milk that ever happened to turn sour in my fridge. I would be remiss if I neglected to mention how much Mrs. Epp loved her coffee. It was not unusual for her to drink three, sometimes four cups of coffee while she ate her lunch. I was kept busy just refilling her mug. Mrs. Epp also loved to bake. She would delight in describing to me the abundance and assortment of baking that she would produce at home in her kitchen, both for church functions and for family get-togethers. Our family benefited as well. At Easter time, there were Pascha loaves arranged on a pretty tray surrounded by little chocolate eggs. Just before Christmas, a platter would arrive loaded down with assorted cookies and always little Christmas gifts for our three kids. Big tins of almond roca when they got older. Around 10 years ago, Karen arrived on the scene to help her mom. Karen did the heavier cleaning while Mrs. Epp ironed. Nothing seemed to please her more than when she arrived at our house on a Friday morning to find a big laundry basket heaped with wrinkled shirts, pants, blouses, tablecloths, and napkins. 
Happily, she would iron the morning away. And my husband, Ron, was equally as happy. He would loudly proclaim that no one could iron like Mrs. Epp. And he would admonish her that she should just keep ironing and not even concern herself with any cleaning. Just iron, just iron. Mrs. Epp's passing has left a big hole in our family. She was humble and gentle, innately tender-hearted and kind. Mrs. Epp did not have an easy life. Sorrow and suffering and loss did not pass her by. They left their indelible mark on her. And yet she never complained, nor did she ever feel sorry for herself. She was saddened by her past traumas, but she was not overwhelmed by them. Though Mrs. Epp was quiet and meek, and perhaps even a little bit timid of life, she faced death with grace and courage. Mrs. Epp was indeed, as the old hymn goes, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. We will miss her gentle presence in our home. Hello, family. I want to invite you to close your eyes. I want you to invite you to use your imagination of a craftsman coming up to a pottery wheel, apron, dirty from work, picking up a lump of clay and forming it as the wheel turns into a beautiful one-of-a-kind vase. And the wheel stops and it is carefully removed and sanded it is painted jet black with a little gold rim around the top. And then picking up paints and paint brushes, beautiful red roses are painted on the vase. Then it is sealed and it is placed perfect and signed, ready for a life of beauty, inspiring others. Someone comes along and admires it, purchases it, brings it home, and on the way home, trips over a loose cobblestone or a rock and the beautiful vase falls and there is a chip, a chip that will always be there. Over time, more accidents, more chips, more cracks, a beloved vase, or vase, sorry, and from a distance you can see the original beauty, but when you get closer, all of the damage and cracks and chips becomes clear. I invite you to open your eyes. You and I are like that vase. Susie Epp was like that vase. There are things that are common to every single one of us, things that we are not strangers to. The innocence and beauty of a baby, the tumbles and spills of a toddler, the bizarre experimenting of our teenage years as our parents shake their head and say, they will learn. The mistakes and the damage of life when we start to make our own big choices. We all know this. You and I have felt happiness. You and I have felt pain. Most of us have had a broken heart. That did not feel good. We've hoped for things and received them. We've hoped for things and they fell through. We've all experienced the unexpected sweet pleasure of a day off that you didn't even know was coming. The frustration of a cold or a flu, broken bones, sick bodies. The wonder of listening to a child sing to themselves when no one is watching. What we walk through every day in this plane of existence is this wide spectrum of brilliant light and cold darkness and muted grays, all the muted grays in between. And maybe that's why the passing of a godly person like Susie Epp is so many things as well. We experience so many things now. On the highest level, yes, we rejoice that our sister Susie is with her Savior. She has reached out and grasped his hand, reaching out for her. She has stepped out of time and space, and she now lives in a reality that is still the future for us. 
It's described in Revelation chapter 21. The dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now that is the future for you and I, but that is the present reality for Susie, and it is a welcome one for her. We have heard through testimony and story that she had many troubles and struggles. She was orphaned at 15, her family torn apart by war. She came to Canada very poor. She experienced the great joys of finding her soulmate, Willie, and having children together, and then the intense emotional pain of losing him far too soon. She felt loss, she felt despair, she felt pain, but she kept going. She did not give up. She was that beautiful vase, cracked and broken, but with light shining through the cracks. Can you imagine that? Think of that vase, with all the cracks, but with light shining through from the light that is within. But not anymore. The broken pieces have shattered and fallen away, and the light remains. Everything that she truly is and will be for eternity remains. Now, heaven is the future of all who follow Jesus, but it is Susie's current permanent address. And we know this because we saw the fruit of a follower of Jesus in her life. Amen, family? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Jesus told us to look for these things. They were a sign that someone was in him, was following him. John chapter 15 says, I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a person remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, <laughs> you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so, we say with confidence that Susie is now without a doubt with Jesus because she was so clearly with him in her life. That's how it works. With him in life, with him in death, with him in life after death. So that's one of the things that we hold on to today. Great joy. And with it, great sorrow. We always feel sadness over difficult times. That's normal. That's a normal human response. But today we feel a type of sadness even over the happy memories, don't we? Because we know that we will have no new memories with Susie. And that is hard. That is the pain of loss. That's a special kind of pain that takes even happiness. And then there's a note of sadness, isn't it? And that too is a part of our reality. But may I offer you some perspective as we process that? We do not dishonor Susie in the slightest when we acknowledge that she was a cracked vase. Beautiful but not perfect. With light shining through the cracks. There are those who pass, and there are far more cracks made by bad decisions and stubbornness and faithlessness. It's true. Today is much, much less complicated because of Susie's godly life. Amen? Much less complicated. Let's be thankful for that. Also, there are those who pass away, and there is no light shining through the cracks. We don't have to process that kind of pain today. And for that, we should be truly, truly grateful. Most of the pain is because our mourning is about the physical absence of our dear Susie, because of how good it was to have her here with us. We know we will see her again, even as we continue on this journey, cracked as imperfect as we are too. A follower of Jesus is, if anything, a person who is in a constant state of transformation, letting go of sinful impulses and habits and desires, and instead taking hold of Jesus more and more. And that was Susie's experience. Susie experienced transformation throughout her life, and she has now experienced the final outcome of all that metamorphosis. She needed a savior, and she said yes to him. 1 John 1 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth 
He's not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful. And He is just. And He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Susie claimed that. She also believed, Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, period. This belief gave her great strength to endure and it gave her great courage to hope. John chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. That is what Susie believed. And the journey that followed for her has now come to an incredible, glorious, completely successful ending. And because of that, it is a beginning. She is in the arms of her Savior, and she knows that she made the right choice with her life. Her eternal life is now firmly in front of her, and she wants you, every single one of you, to join her. Period. That is the reality now. Her hope. Now, you and I, we're still here. We have a lot of decisions still in front of us. We are still going through the spectrum of experiences, the vast array of emotions that come from going through things and reacting to them. And so we know there is happiness and sorrow, joy and suffering in the days ahead, and we know there's plenty of gray coming too. Plenty of just slogging through life with neither high nor low. And there are going to be many times that we wish we could change what was going on around us and inside of us. But since none of us have that kind of control, nobody here has that kind of power, let us bring all of our cares and worries to the one who knows and cares and is mighty to save like Susie did. That's what she did, and I say with confidence, it worked for her. 2 Corinthians 12, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Our sister, Susie, lived a quiet, perseverant, devoted life with light shining through the cracks. May that light... The light of our beautiful Jesus comfort us as we move forward in the days and weeks ahead. Our thoughts and prayers are with you, family. Let us pray. Father, we need rest and peace. We grieve and mourn. We need your comfort. You are the one who can do this for us. We ask you simply for what we need. Please give comfort to Susie's family and friends. Please give us strength to keep going. Please grant us wisdom to choose your ways and your peace over the empty promise of forgetting or getting distracted or moving on too quickly, Father. Let us not miss what you are doing here. Help us to remember our dearly departed without looking away or flinching from the reality of your promises fulfilled in her. Please fill us with your light and let that light shine through the cracks in our own lives. In your beautiful and your perfect, and your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reese, for those words of comfort and encouragement. Camp Squia was a favorite place for our sister. She was always the first one to sign up and encouraging everybody else to sign up as well because of the beauty of nature there. And uh, if you would turn to number 535, we are going to sing about that beauty of this earth. I was thinking as we are going to sing this song, we should think it as if Susie would sing it. 
Before we receive the benediction, I would like to give the following invitation. 
The family would encourage us to join them for a lunch in the fellowship hall, just follow them down through these doors into the hallway and into the gymnasium. And please follow the directions of the ushers. And when you get to the tables, please be seated. And we're going to be first of all watching a video tribute together and then that will be followed by grace and instructions for the meals. Now, please receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>